Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. Today, I'm here with Dr. Francis Beckwith, um, still a professor, right, at, at Baylor University, um, teaching. Um, actually, I'll let you introduce yourself because I know you're doing like sure. philosophy and public ethics and that sort of thing, but yeah. I want you to give the specific title. Sure, yeah. So I am professor of philosophy and church state studies at Baylor uh, University in Waco, Texas. And I also uh, am an affiliate professor of political science and associate director of our graduate program in philosophy. And uh, the story behind the church state studies part of my title is my, I was originally hired at Baylor in 2003 as associate director of the J.M. Dawson Institute for Church State Studies and was tenured in that program. And then a year after that, I was invited to join the philosophy department at Baylor. And so, because my PhD is in philosophy. So one of the things that I asked the Dean, if I could do is keep church state studies in my title, because I write and publish often in the areas of law and religion. So, mm -hmm. so that's what I do at Baylor. Yeah, that's really fascinating. And you know, um, you know, you, you have people down there like Alexander Proust and, and many other great Catholic thinkers. And so I was wondering, you know, is there like a Catholic, uh, uh, you know, invasion <laughs> of Baylor or what's going on there? <laughs> yeah, so it's it's interesting how that, that developed. Um, it, it kind of began before I arrived in 1995. The president at the time, uh, Robert Sloan, uh, wanted to more deeply commit the university to its Christian mission. But several years earlier, his predecessor had uh, separated the institution more from the Baptist General Convention of Texas. They redid their, their bylaws. Mm. And so there was a concern in the Baylor community, how can we not fall prey to what has happened at other institutions that as they separate from the denominational infrastructure, they become less committed to their mission. Ironically, by not being as committed to the denominational structure, it, it freed up Sloan to hire Christians that weren't Baptists, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> more of them. And so the combination of being committed more to the Christian mission and at the same time not being committed to showing great preference for Baptist professors led to this interesting dynamic that resulted in a lot of serious Christians from different traditions teaching at Baylor. And so what I tell people, my Catholic friends, uh, how is it to teach at Baylor? I say, it's, it's, it's amazing. You get the best of both worlds. You get a place that's seriously Christian. You have colleagues that are Catholic, but you also have colleagues that aren't. So you get challenged, right? So you, but you're challenged by people that are friends. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a nice, I, I think it's a, it's a nice environment for somebody that isn't Catholic. And you also don't have the burden of being so concerned about intra church battles because I'm not a Baptist. So I don't have a, I don't have a dog in that fight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Dr. Beckwith, thank you for, um, you know, just uh, coming onto my show and uh, you know, obviously the, the topic for today is going to be Roe v. Wade. And, you know, we'll touch a little bit into, you know, the more substantive moral issues undergirding abortion. But I really wanted to focus on the legal matters because I know you've written on both, especially, you know, your, your 2007 book by Cambridge University Press, Defending Life. And I wanted to ask you, would you consider that to be maybe like the definitive work that you published in that area? Or do you feel like there's another book or some other place or article that you feel like kind of captures your thought best? Yeah, I think that book does it, at least in terms of my own position. Uh, in the book, I deal with the legal, the moral, and political aspects of abortion. So it differs in this sense from other books that deal mostly with the legal and the political and others that are almost exclusively philosophical. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to combine both. So I will tell you that I think that there are books by philosophers that are better than mine <laughs> philosophically in the sense that I think they dig uh, more deeply into the literature. And there are people that have written on the legal and political exclusively that I think, you know, again, are, are more uh, deeply, um, you know, conversant with 
the history of, of, of the debate in law and politics. But what I try to do is combine both to mm -hmm. kind of give people a sense of why the law is the law. That is, how, how did we arrive at Roe v. Wade and Casey versus Planned Parenthood and these other decisions? And also introduce people, let's say, who are uh, in law and politics who have never really examined the philosophical reasons why people uh, are in favor of abortion rights and why pro-lifers are critical of those views. Hmm. All right. Well, let me get to my first question then. So okay. my first question is, you know, just can you walk us through, um, you know, what happened you know, even leading up to and during Roe v. Wade and, and, and the court's decision itself? Yeah, so Roe v. Wade uh, comes out in 1973. This is uh, roughly about a decade after there are rumblings in American politics about changing abortion law. So roughly from the middle of the 19th century up until the mid 1960s, in every state of the union, abortion was illegal, except for in a certain exceptions, life of the mother. Um, I think some laws allowed for rape and incest, but those were actually quite uh, rare. So what had happened though, is that in the mid sixties, 1965, uh, the Supreme Court issues an opinion called Griswold versus Connecticut, which is a case involving a Connecticut statute that prohibited the buying and selling and use of contraception. And the court finds in this case that Connecticut's law is unconstitutional based on something called a right to privacy. Even though the right to privacy is not enumerated in the Constitution, there's no explicit line in the Bill of Rights about a right of privacy, the court says that it's implied, it's part of uh, our nation's tradition, that the government stay out of private matters that in con concern marital intimacy. And then eight years later, the Supreme Court takes that reasoning of Griswold versus Connecticut and applies it to the issue of abortion. So in terms of how the case got to the Supreme Court, there was a woman named Norma McCorvey who in the case took the pseudonym Jane Roe, and she filed suit in a Texas court against Texas's law that prohibited abortion in all cases except for life of the mother and she winds up uh, uh actually the court the, the supreme court actually heard oral arguments twice in this case mm. uh i think once in 1971 and again in 72 because president nixon had uh replaced certain justices including the one who would or actually the one he chose uh, would eventually write the majority opinion, Justice Harry Blackman. So the, the, the case gets to the Supreme Court in, in, in late 19, actually 71, and then again in 72. And the court finds that there is uh, a right to abortion by way of the right to privacy that the court had found eight years earlier in Griswold versus Connecticut. All right. So, you know, um, you, you mentioned Griswold, but I know that there's another case often mentioned with Roe v. Wade, which is um, Planned Parenthood v. Casey. And so I was wondering if you could also talk about what happened there. Yeah, so that case involved a statute in the state of Pennsylvania. In fact, the, the, the name Casey is the name, the last name of the governor at the time, Robert Casey, who was a pro-life Democrat. Uh, you know, some of your uh, listeners and viewers may think that's kind of odd because the way in which we sort of divvy up our political landscape is we tend to, uh, and, and rightfully because the parties have taken positions on this, we tend to think pro-life Republican, pro-choice Democrat. But in the 70s and even all the way into the mid 80s, there were people on both sides of the aisle that were pro-life. In fact, in the early 70s, it is likely that if you had polled rank and file Democrats and Republicans, that the Democratic Party would have a larger number of people that were pro-life. And the reason for that is that they were one of the largest constituencies in the Democratic Party were ethnic Catholics, people, the um, first, second, and third generation 
immigrants that had come from Ireland and Italy and Germany that had come to the United States and they gravitated the, to the Democratic Party because of their policies concerning welfare and uh, pro-union, but they were also morally quite conservative. And so Robert Casey was sort of part of that, that enclave of people that once at one point dominated the, the Democratic Party. They obviously no longer uh, dominate the party, but Casey, the, the, there was a law in the state of Pennsylvania that had several provisions to it that limited access to abortion. And some of them, I'm thinking if I remember them all off the top of my head, one of them was um, 24 hour waiting period, um, parental notification, spousal notification, might have been spousal consent. I, I don't I, I don't know entirely. I think it may have just, I suspect it was just notification. And then there was uh, an aspect of it that I think involved judicial bypass so that, that if a minor could show or a spouse could show that if the um, parent or, or husband, um, you know, uh, you know, was abusive that, you know, a judge could say, no, you can go get the abortion anyways, without the notification. Mm -hmm. And I think there was also something about um, in the bill that involved um, uh, fetal development that uh, the, the, um, uh, oh, the, no, I'm sorry, it, it limited, um, that's right, the aspect of it had to do with the, uh, that at 20 weeks or at via, roughly viability, uh, there had a test had to be given to show that uh, the fetus was viable. So there, there were limits on abortion. Uh, and so what happens is the Supreme Court upholds every single one of those provisions, except for the one involving spousal notification. Now, that differs from the way the court looked at the right to abortion between Roe v. Wade and Casey. So Roe v. Wade's decided in 1973, Casey is 1992. Mm -hmm. So the Supreme Court in Casey says, uh, the right to abortion is still a fundamental right, but states have slightly more discretion in what they can do in terms of limiting that right the uh, trimester breakdown, and what's that? Well, in Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court said that the state's interest in prenatal life increases as the fetus develops, and black men divided pregnancy into trimesters. He says in the first trimester, the only thing that the state should care about is the health of the woman, and so they can only regulate abortion insofar as it protects her from uh, being harmed in any way due to the surgery. Uh, second trimester, they can have a few more regulations, but it should have nothing to do with prenatal life and protecting it. But in the third trimester, the court says there the child can live outside the womb. It is viable and the state can restrict abortion more significantly. What happens in Casey, the court says no more trimester breakdown. Viability is the key line. And after that, the um, the state can significantly uh, regulate it, uh, but prior to that, it can regulate it, but it can't do it in a way that results in an undue burden to the woman. Now, what does an undue burden mean? We don't really know. I mean, that's one of the criticisms of Casey is that there's a lot of this vague language in there. So in, in Roe v. Wade, the court used a different standard. They used a standard uh, which is, is, is sometimes referred to as compelling state interest. Now, what that's another kind of legalese term. It simply means that if the government is going to regulate something, it needs a really, 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 really good reason. And so to use an example outside of abortion, the government cannot regulate speech except for in cases in which it has a compelling interest. So laws that prohibit perjury or laws that prohibit defamation those constitute compelling interest um, so the court in casey literally changes the standard by which the court uh, evaluates 
uh, abortion regulation, although it still says abortion is a fundamental right. So lately, when people have been talking about this recent case, which I know we'll be we'll be discussing in a minute or two, uh, the case in Mississippi that we've seen, that we've heard about, or we've read the leaked uh, uh, draft of, 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 of of, of the majority opinion or alleged majority opinion. Um, people talk about that. They talk about overturning Roe v. Wade. And technically, Roe v. Wade really isn't the law right now. The law really is Casey versus Planned Parenthood, which again, affirms what the court says is the quote unquote central holding of Roe, but winds up gutting a lot of the, the rules on what states can do. So that's where we're at today. All right. So let's see. You know, I, I was enjoying it so much. I actually almost lost <laughs> my place in the, um, in the roster. Okay. So, you know, given the fact that, you know, you are a legal scholar and, you know, you, you, you obviously said the ins and outs of the law. Um, mm -hmm. Where would you begin then? I guess you can critique um, Roe v. Wade, obviously. But I mean, I guess Casey is another place where you might want to jump and talk about too. And so, or maybe you want to go as far back as Griswold v. Connecticut, right? Yeah. So, um, I mean, there's lots of criticisms that one can raise against all those opinions. Mm -hmm. um, I think the big difference between Griswold and Roe, and even Justice Blackman recognized this, that in Griswold, even if you think that the idea of a right of privacy is kind of made up, that there really isn't a right of privacy, uh, that the court is relying not so much on the text of the Constitution, or not at all on the text of the Constitution, but what is sometimes called a, a substantive due process right. Now, what's that? That, that is uh, a right that is unenumerated in the Constitution. It's actually not written down, but it is presupposed or assumed in what is called ordered liberty. Now, what does that mean? Let me give you an illustration. There's nothing in the Constitution that says that parents, that the biological parents of children have the fundamental right and obligation to care and nurture those children. And yet the Supreme Court in an early 20th century case said that the child is not the mere creature of the state. And they engaged in substantive due process in the sense that they said, look, not every right can be written down that a culture or society can presuppose certain goods as being so essential and fundamental that no one it never even occurred to anyone to write it down so i, I say this because i want to be fair to the court i i actually am not entirely unsympathetic to the idea of substantive due process yeah <laughs> i i do think that uh i i'm not a pure textualist <laughs> i i am a conservative originalist, but not a Scalia textualist. I, I tend to think that there are certain fundamental goods that are presupposed in ordered liberty. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 so I, I don't want to, I'm not somebody that easily thinks that Griswold is like obviously wrong, mm -hmm. you know? So I think it's, I think it has got problems to it, but I, I want to be fair. Uh, about it. So because if you look at the way in which Justice Douglas writes that plurality opinion, he refers to the sanctity of the marital bed as 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 the sort of basis for a right of privacy. And somebody who, let's say, holds to traditional understandings of morality and marriage can say, yeah, I can see how that mm -hmm. how, how, how uh, you know, a court could see that right as as a fundamental good just as much as it sees parental rights and obligations in terms of uh, guiding one's children as something that wasn't written down because nobody thought that anyone would have would even challenge it right so so the way that 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 Roe differs from Griswold it, it, again Blackman recognizes this in his majority opinion is that it involves a third party. You know, it's one thing to say that a married couple within the confines of their intimate life should have the right to make choices about that life. Even if you think that maybe it's immoral, but still, you could still not want the state to be involved with it. Here though, you have 
a third party, namely an unborn human being. How do you deal with that? And that was the thing about Roe that, that differs remarkably from the other right of privacy opinions. And to deal with this, Justice Blackman had a couple of hurdles uh, that, that he had to jump. <laughs> One of them had to do with the fact that in the 19th century, most of the states, probably, I think it's almost two thirds of the states around the time of the Civil War prohibited abortion in their statutes. So if the right of privacy, which the court believes or affirms is implied by the 14th Amendment, uh, if, if the right of, if the 14th Amendment, if the right of privacy is found there and the 14th Amendment is passed soon after the Civil War, and at the time, virtually every state prohibits abortion, how do you, how can you say that the right of privacy grounds abortion if it never occurred to anyone at the time, right? I mean, and, and so uh, how do you deal with that? So what, what Blackman says in his opinion, he says, oh, well, uh, those 19th century statutes were not intended to protect unborn human life. That may have been a secondary consideration, but the primary consideration was to protect women from dangerous operations. And since abortion is now relatively safe for women compared to how it was in the 19th century, there's no need for these statutes. Therefore, what kicks in is a right that women had uh, at common law, namely a right to terminate their pregnancies. And that raises the question, well, wait a second, did they really have a right at common law to terminate their pregnancies? And it turns out that the data there is mixed in terms of, not in terms of whether there was a right, but in terms of how the law thought of unborn life. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that comes out when you read, for example, authors dealing with the history of the common law is that it, usually after quickening, it was prohibited by law. What was quickening? Quickening is the time in which the woman can first feel the movements of her unborn child. And it is likely that the reason why the common law, and by the way, the common law is the law that we inherited from, from England. Uh, and the, there, it's law that developed in courts, not out of legislatures or parliament. So, the reason why that was the standard was because nobody really knew at the time if the fetus was alive, right? You can't be prosecuted for performing an abortion on a fetus that is not alive, right? Because uh, because you're not actually killing it, right? It's already it's already dead. So one of the things that that we've learned actually since Roe v. Wade, that there's been so much scholarship about pre-Roe law and common law understandings of prenatal life, is that it is likely that the quickening criterion arises originally from medieval views of ensoulment. That is the idea that once the rational soul enters the developing human being at let's say 40 weeks, which was Aquinas's view, that's when quickening occurs. And then it probably evolves into a evidential standard. That is, you know, you can't prosecute someone for procuring an abortion if the fetus isn't alive. And the only way we can know it's alive is if the woman felt it, right? So that, that, that's, and so what Blackman does though, is he, he takes that ambiguity or that, that um, differing levels of of punishment or prosecution for abortions procured before and after quickening and infers from that, oh, women had a right to terminate their pregnancies prior to quickening. And that's not at all what the common law taught. And one of the, the great virtues, I think, of Justice Alito's draft, uh, he actually directly addresses this in that opinion. All right, but <clears throat> okay. So, I mean, suppose somebody at this point says, "Oh, well, that you know, that's all well and good, I guess." But um, look, Rose established precedent now, right? So, what what can we really do about it? You know, uh, why should we try and overturn it at this point? 
Well, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one, uh, if, if the reasoning is that bad, uh, I mean, that in and of itself, I think, is a good reason to over, overturn a Supreme Court opinion. But combine that with the nature of the disagreement. So supposing, let's compare this to Griswold versus Connecticut. I mean, supposing, you know, somebody comes to the conclusion that the whole right of privacy regime is flawed. Okay, what's, if we, if in fact, uh, were to overturn, let's say, Grizzle versus Connecticut, which is highly unlikely, uh, what would happen? Would there be a great controversy? Uh, no, actually what would happen is that every state, if any state still had on its books any uh, prohibitions against contraception, they would be changed instantly. It's not a, it's not a, um, it's not an issue over which there is deep disagreement. And I think the reason for that is, I mean, people it, it just, people have for largely, I mean, with the exception of, of, of certain segments of religious citizens, uh, mostly Catholics, um, there isn't a, there just isn't an anti-contraceptive movement. In addition to that, going back to what I'd said earlier, the issue of contraception doesn't involve a third party. I mean, you think about the issue in abortion, unlike the issue in, in Griswold, is not one that is no longer in dispute. It is probably in greater dispute than it's ever been. So one of the things that the, the court, Supreme Court has roughly come up with some criteria of determining whether it's good to overturn uh, a law or a, a prior opinion or a prior case. One of the, the standards is, is, is it still a disputed question, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? And now, now you may think, well, being wrong in and of itself, wouldn't that be a good reason? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, as a, as a professor and somebody that deals with this in the abstract, you know, I say, yeah, that's right. If it's, if it's unreasonable, we should overturn it. But I understand why a judge or a justice wouldn't want to do it. Um, their, their thinking is that, um, you know, 90% of the public isn't going to understand the reasoning anyways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so just let sleeping dogs lie, right? So I do think that that's, that's part of it. I also think that, to be honest, I don't think Griswold, I mean, I think Griswold is flawed, but I think that there is at least an anchor in history that it could, that, that it could associate itself with. I, I, Connecticut was one of only a very few states that actually had anti-contraception laws. So it wasn't like abortion at all. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a different, different thing altogether. Right. And, and sorry, just to back up really quick, too, because we were t talking about the historical precedent. I mean, you, you mentioned that the common law didn't have this view that um, before quickening, a woman had a right to an abortion. What was the common law position? You know, I, 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 I don't I don't know <laughs> you know off the top of my head. I mean, in terms of because when you mentioned the common law, it's about courts, right? Mm -hmm. So you would you would need somebody uh, uh, prosecuting it. So my understanding is that it was considered to be a kind of misdemeanor, mm. right? And I think after quickening, uh, it was considered to be uh, kind of what is called a gross misdemeanor. Uh, but it wasn't. It wasn't. I think we have to be careful here is that mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to how laws or how uh, particular activities are labeled doesn't necessarily tell us about the um, what the society believed about, let's say, unborn human beings, because mm -hmm. it could very well be. Uh, and th this is actually an interesting. Uh, it's an interesting way to think about even when it becomes statutory in the 19th century, how were women uh, who procured abortions prosecuted? Because one of the questions that often comes up, in right, especially right now, uh, on the verge of what seems to be the overturning of Roe v. Wade, 
what would happen what happens in states in which abortion becomes illegal will women be prosecuted and it turns out a great way to answer this question is actually go back to the law before roe v wade what did the statute say and virtually all of them gave women uh, a kind of immunity mm -hmm. <laughs> and the thinking was that by giving one of the parties immunity you would be more likely to limit the number of abortions sought that is uh, if you have every party involved in the uh, procedure prosecuted you're never going to get any you know you're not going to decrease the number of abortions occurring right because everybody has an interest in remaining quiet the other thing the the other thing that that most of these uh, legislators assumed was that the woman seeking an illegal abortion was in a desperate situation. And so there was already a kind of assumed mitigating state of mind. Now, one could say that kind of reveals a kind of paternalism, right? But but still, I mean, you know, I, I'm sort of amazed when I hear, I, you know, if I get on social media and people talk about, you know, uh, regulating abortion or making it illegal, oh, what are you gonna do, throw women in jail? And of course, it's so easy to answer. Like, why don't you just go back to what happened before Roe? Mm -hmm. It turns mm -hmm. out that the, the law was, I think in a way, showed a kind of wisdom, right? It recognized the sanctity of the life of unborn human beings, but also recognized the unique nature of pregnancy and the particular difficulty that a woman is in, in a situation in which she seeks to procure an abortion. Right. And so that, in, and I think we, we have to, I mean, it reveals at least to me that those that crafted those laws tried to, on the one hand, recognize that unborn human beings are part of the human community, but also recognizing the unique circumstances of pregnancy. So what did, what did those laws say about, let's say, I don't know, the doctor or the one who actually, you know, does the procedure that kills the child? Did they have a different standard for them or was the immunity oh, extended. No, it was not yeah. extended to them. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, I mean, I've not read every statute. I'm relying mostly on an article. Uh, and also there's, a, there's been several books published, uh, actually more than several, uh, scores of books published since the 70s about abortion law, as well as, I mean, as you can imagine, hundreds of law review articles. But mm -hmm. I think it was Robert Byrne, who I think was a historian at Fordham University, I'm not sure, may have been Georgetown. And then uh, James Witherspoon, who uh, published, I think it was a, uh, he may have been a professor at the University of San Diego. Uh, he published an article in 1984 um, called, I think called Rethinking Roe v. Wade or Revisiting Roe v. Wade. I, I forget the title of it, but Witherspoon by far has the most exhaustive analysis. He actually went through every single statute and examined the legislative debates uh, on, on the statutes. And the point of his article was to show that Justice Blackmun's um, arguments had no historical weight whatsoever. Uh, and one reason for that is that Blackmun relied exclusively on two articles written by a lawyer named Cyril Means, who was the attorney for the National Abortion Rights Action League, mm. or the, I think, was it the National Association for the Repeal of Abortion Laws? So in a different, same acronym, but different, uh, different meaning. So, uh, and that, I mean, that's one reason why um, uh, I think Justice Alito, in his uh, draft uh, of the, uh, of what may be the overturning of Roe v. Wade, uh, do, uh, the Dobbs case um, uh, spends so much time on those historical arguments because he he wants to uh, be critical of Roe and show why it's a mistaken or flawed opinion. In fact, what's astonishing is that if you look at all the abortion cases in which you've had, let's say, the you know Roe v. Wade reaffirmed. And you've got dissents in those cases by justices like Scalia, uh, Rehnquist. Um, let's see who else would write a dissent. Um, Thomas. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever goes after like the core of Roe. 
which is amazing. Like, you know, <laughs> uh, and it's, and so it, it's, a, it's astonishing to me that it took almost 50 years for a justice to issue an opinion right. that actually goes after the grounding of Roe. Rather than, I mean, what you have in Scalia is mostly, well, you know, it's, it's not what the original text says. Um, and that, that's fine, but I do think that showing that the reasoning itself is flawed uh, has great merit to it. Yeah, and speaking of uh, Dobbs v. Jackson, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, given the fact that this opinion seems to have been leaked, um, first off, I mean, I, I think the answer is yes, but I guess, should we be concerned about the fact that a Supreme Court um, opinion was leaked early? And the second thing I wanted to ask you was, have you read the opinion at all? And what are your thoughts on at least the merits of it? It seems like you've read some of it, but what do you think about it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in terms of the first question, I think it's a terrible thing yeah. <laughs> for for anyone to leak uh, an opinion uh, or any, any aspect of a confidential uh, consultation in any court, right? I mean, this is something that I think uh, conservatives ought to take to heart as well as liberals and progressives and everybody in between, that what makes the law the law and what makes certain principles binding on us is not that it's up to our discretion to obey them <laughs> mm -hmm. and, that, and that the times when we ought to, the, the times in which they're most difficult to obey, that is when, when we realize, oh, if I disobey the rules of this particular practice, namely being a member of the legal community of the Supreme Court, is the time in which it is in my, mo in, in my best, in, in my interest to break it. That's the time in which you should obey it more fervently. I mean, this is, it, 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 you know, I because I've, I've read online, I've seen on the um, uh, social media, law professors of all people uh, saying things like, you should be more concerned about the opinion rather than the fact that it was leaked. And I, I think back to uh, that, 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 that line in um, uh, uh, a Man for All Seasons, which is the movie about Th Sir Thomas More, St. Thomas More, and, and the, the actor playing Thomas More is confronted, I think, by his son-in-law, who encourages him to uh, violate the law in order to get at the king. I think that's it. It's been a year since I've seen it. Mm -hmm. and, and he says, I will not break the law even if even if I could prosecute the devil himself, hmm. and his and he says that if I were to, uh, you know, mow down every tree to get at something, uh, what will if I have to mow down every law to get at what I think is just, there will be no laws left to protect me, mm -hmm. and so I think people have to have to remember that and realize that that the reason why we have, for example, confidentiality uh, between, let's say, client and uh, attorney or between physician and patient. Now, I'm not saying the confidentiality in the Supreme Court is on that level. Mm -hmm. There's debate about whether it actually, what happened could be prose prosecuted. But the point is that those are in place so that justice can be achieved. Think about it this way. If you knew, for example, that every discussion that you had with a friend or a spouse or a close relative was being would be recorded and posted, you would not be as candid. You would not be as honest. Probably, <laughs> you you would hedge things because you would all. So imagine if justice is new, that every single comment they would make. In, 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 set, in private sessions were not secure. Um, they may hold back on an argument or a point that could actually result in somebody being treated more fairly and more justly. Mm -hmm. And so this is, you know, I, this is, I, mean, think, I, I think about even in my own experience as a faculty member, 
There are times when faculty meet and talk about our grad students and we're really candid. I can't imagine like how we would talk if we thought that somebody was taking notes <laughs> and going to distribute them later, right? And, and, and what would happen is that we could actually harm people, right? We may decide not to be as candid and that winds up maybe uh, rewarding people who don't deserve to be rewarded or not punishing people who ought to be punished, right? I mean, that's just, so the nature of, of, of what happened, I think is, is, is terrible. And, um, and I, you know, I, I'm warm by the fact that lots of people on all both sides of the aisle condemned this, but then there were people that just said, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, what's more important is that, um, uh, that Justice uh, Alito issued this opinion, which they believed or believe is, 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 is itself a, a far greater injustice. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the rules uh, that we have in place for how we conduct our lives um, are in some ways far more important than you know, little victories that we may achieve as a consequence of violating those rules. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then to the second question on, you know, your thoughts on the opinion itself, oh, what you've read so far, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I like the opinion. I think it is thorough. Um, he deals with uh, some of the issues I've already brought up. He talks about the historical basis for Roe v. Wade. He deals with the, the doctrine of stare, de stare decisis, which is the view that, um, that there ought to be great deference for precedence. And he says, yes, there should be. And then he goes over what are sort of the traditional criteria to determine whether a, uh, a case should be overturned. And he thinks that... Um, that Roe v. Wade uh, does not fit, or, or, or what is it, the criteria for, for a, uh, an opinion not to be overturned. So he thinks doesn't think that Roe v. Wade fulfills that, mm -hmm. and, and Casey as well, and uh, and he also deals with some of the concerns that uh, people have well have raised actually since the the. the um, the leak of the draft, but also brought up uh, around the time of oral arguments that if, in fact, Roe v. Wade is overturned and Casey is overturned, what does that tell us about? Uh, does that mean that uh, cases involving contraception like Grizzle versus Connecticut or interracial marriage or same sex marriage, since they have a kind of similar, according to the, the critics, similar reasoning to Roe, wouldn't it mean that those those opinions are also right for being overturned? And he deals, he deals with that as well. And he focuses in that regard on the whole third party argument that the real issue in Roe was whether a states have a, a rightful place to try to protect unborn life. And he thinks that, yes, indeed, states do, and that the case that Road Road made uh, to say the states didn't is not very persuasive. Wow, that sounds pretty incredible. Um, yeah. You know, I'm sure I can find the opinion somewhere, but I don't. I don't know if I want to just read it just yet because I feel like um, what is it like? You know, like stolen water has been given to me, and I'm just like, I don't know if I should drink that. You know, um, I don't know if you have any yeah. thoughts on that. But yeah, yeah, you know, it's funny. I actually thought about that. I remember when I <laughs> I, I, I I remember when the story hit. And I just did, I thought, oh, it was leaked, but I didn't think anyone put it online. So I just thought, oh, the, the, the Politico folks are reading it and giving us excerpts. Yeah. And then it wasn't like until two days later mm. that I discovered, oh my Lord, it's actually there. Yeah. And I downloaded it and I printed it out and I was actually gonna meet with, I actually wound up meeting with some friends in Washington DC law types we were meeting for another reason. Uh, we, we, we meet every, every year or so. Uh, there's a group of us um, that meet and talk about legal cases. Um, I can't tell you more than that, but it's yeah. a kind mm -hmm. of private little collection of friends and it's really wonderful. And, and I was going to actually, I, part of my uh, contribution to the discussion, I was going to talk about rethinking the, the school prayer cases. And so 
in an email exchange, uh, I mentioned, well, why don't we talk about this new Alito, <laughs> uh, you know, leaked uh, draft? And and there were a couple of people there who were uh, who had actually clerked the Supreme Court who were saying, no, I don't, I don't think that's a good idea. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, so that there was almost like it was almost like that's that's sacred we shouldn't <laughs> i mean so so I, you know and i and i kind of felt bad i thought oh maybe i shouldn't have you know um you know raised that but uh but i wound up reading it anyways and uh, i mean it, it clearly i mean i think if it becomes the majority opinion i think it's going to be different for a couple of reasons i think you're going to probably have 30 to 40 extra pages onto it of responses to dissents mm-hmm. now what would be really weird is if Alito responds to online critics <laughs> in the draft. So so it would be the first in that case, you would have to find some sort of what's the right reference to the draft of a Supreme Court opinion. Mm-hmm. Right. So if you go to like the mm-hmm. Chicago style of citation, right, you have all these things. We'll, we'll have to include something called, you know, citation of a draft opinion, which I don't I don't think there's actually I don't think we've well, we've never seen one before. Mm-hmm. Right? Unless you've worked at the Supreme Court, it's never been published. Um, so, yeah, so I think I think the final version, if it becomes the majority opinion, will probably be larger. I don't have any doubt about that. Uh, I think you'll have concurring opinions from. Uh, you may get concurring opinions from every single member of the majority. And here the majority remember that when a, a, a case is decided. All you need is five justices to agree on who should win. Mm -hmm. But who should win is not the same as the reasoning of the court. Right. So so if let's say so right now, according to Politico story, there are five justices that sign on have signed on to Alito's majority opinion, which basically says Roe v. Wade is overturned and Casey is overturned. Then you have Justice Roberts, who is a sixth vote for Mississippi to win, mm-hmm. but doesn't agree that Roe v. Wade should be over or and Casey should be overturned. Actually, he thinks that Casey should be overturned, but Roe v. Wade should be upheld. <laughs> and the Mississippi law is not technically in violation of Roe v. Wade, mm. which I think I mean, I, I'm Almost, I'm curious to see his reasoning because I think it's a crazy <laughs> thing. I mean, I just I don't know how he gets it. I mean, it's almost like somebody saying, "Yeah, the Bible talks about tennis because it says that Joseph served in Pharaoh's court, right?" I mean, yeah, the words are there. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I'm not sure they mean the same thing. You know, I I don't know. I mean, I have great respect for just Chief Justice Roberts. I think he's a brilliant guy. I think he's a man of integrity. I have conservative friends that that have problems with him. I think I, I think he's a and look, I, I don't want to I, I don't want to judge people when I don't know, you know, the sort of struggles they go through, you know, and especially as Chief Justice. So but uh, so so it could be six to three for Mississippi to win, but five to overturn Roe and Casey. Or you could have, how about this, six to overturn Casey, right? Five to overturn Roe, right? Or you could have the, I mean, you could have a weird, so who knows what's gonna, I mean, I think, yeah. Yeah, so who knows what's going to happen? So, so you could theoretically have a case. I mean, if if let's say John, uh, Roberts is able to get one of the other, uh, one of the five, obviously with the, I doubt he has a chance at Alito or or Thomas or even probably Gorsuch, uh, maybe. So I think the the Kavanaugh is the most likely. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I don't. You know, this is all speculation. I mean, so much of this, when we speculate about the justices has to do with like our the public presentation of the justices by the media mm-hmm. like we we don't know them like i mean i i i mean i've met uh let's see how many i've met two justices it, it, actually three uh, in my life and the one the one i and one of them i didn't even meet when he was a chief when he was a justice it was gorsuch at an event at princeton in 2013 uh and I met Alito once, uh, hung out with him at a bar. 
<laughs> uh, he just he happened to be at a conference and it's and i you know we, and then uh scalia as well i was uh, at mm -hmm. a i took a, a continuing legal education course with justice scalia in 2013 uh on separation of powers and i talked to him for a while uh after one of his lectures and that was the and so i, I mean i don't know you know nobody other than a few people not, nobody knows these people you know at least you know, so everything we speculate about, I mean, obviously people do know them, but I mean, in terms of, of, of like, you know, what's going on in their minds about the legal rationale. I mean, that's, I mean, that's just pure speculation. So, um, so yeah, so supposing Roberts is able to get Kavanaugh to vote with him, uh, then you have um, a five to not overturn uh, Roe, five to overturn Roe and Casey, right? Mm. And three to neither overturn, not to overturn Roe or Casey, and uh, four to overturn, or, or five, I forgot, whatever, I forgot how, yeah. the, 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 those two would go uh, to, to, the, to the other three with, uh, in terms of, of, of Roe. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if that were to happen, uh, and so, so you'd have this weird thing. I mean, if, if Roberts could do that, I mean, you could actually have like Casey overturned, but not Roe, mm -hmm. which would be bizarre because you would have, because in some ways Casey did significantly modify Roe. So you'd, you'd be yeah. essentially saying, uh, we're, we're, you'd have, I mean, it'd just be bizarre. You'd have like a, a, most of the court saying some abortion opinion should be overturned, but we're just not sure which one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Mm. So then it's not, it, you know, some people think like this. Well, I mean, I think it, it, it'll be a victory nonetheless for the pro-life side, but in terms of the nuances of how big the victory actually is, that's another question. Would that be fair to say? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, um, it would be a significant victory. Um, uh, Roe v. Wade, uh, was considered and still considered obviously by a lot of people that support the opinion uh, as a kind of mega uh, or a super uh, an uber opinion that or an uber that, that it's like it's unlike any uh, ever and uh, so the idea that the court would overturn it is you know is is as unbelievable to me as when the soviet union fell mm -hmm. so i mm -hmm. grew up during the cold war and I was actually it was my third year of teaching college that the Soviet Union collapsed. And that I mean, for someone who grew up in the Cold War, it, it just you just thought that the, it would continue for the rest of your life. I mean, the idea that the Soviet Union would cease to exist is is strange. And if you had told uh, if you had said, um, you know, if you had told anybody in 1990 that Russia uh, 30 years in the future would become this like pro Russian Orthodox, almost, uh, you know, theocratic state. I mean, people would say, you know, you're out of your mind. Right. I mean, so it's, it's, so you don't know. I mean, one thing I've learned over the past 30 years, um, is anything can happen. Right. I mean, you know, and I think anybody who grows up in any era tends to, you know, romanticize the the sort of their formative years as the time in which it's normal right, <laughs> right? yeah yeah you know so i have to be careful not to think you know that oh uh, but but you know th you know things have happened in the history that have um you know uh, totally surprised people um so yeah so if, if roe v wade is overturned uh then the issue goes back to the states yeah and it's un it's unclear how it's going to affect our politics. Um, I think Roe v. Wade did affect our politics um, in a, in a much different way, uh, in the sense that uh, that it 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 polarized uh, the two parties. So in ways that that were quite different than what had happened before Roe. So I mentioned earlier in, in our conversation that that in the early seventies the parties were not divided in the same way over abortion. And so you more likely to have more pro-life Democrats than pro-life Republicans, probably in 71 or 72. Um, who knows, maybe this changes things 
in terms of the parties, right? I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you know, it, it. Um, so I, I'm not going to predict, but I do think it clearly you're going to have uh, many states passing laws like my home state of Texas, uh, laws that severely restrict abortion, and there'll be other states like New York and California that will, um, you know, ratchet it up. That is, they will uh, actually make laws that are more extreme than Roe. Mm -hmm. And I think we've already seen this in New York. Yeah. Well, I do have just a few more questions and so I'll try to knock them out. So, I mean, this is going to be like the last, I think, really maybe substantive mm -hmm. one. And so it's just a question about, um, you know, liberal state neutrality, right? And whether or not if we had a decision, you know, like, let's say, overturning Roe, perhaps, would that be compatible with what we would expect of a liberal state? That's a big question uh, in, in, ter in terms of what do you, you know, like, so there, there's different types of liberalism. And yeah. so the kind of liberalism that, I, that, I, that, I, that I'm thinking of is, is usually associated with a philosopher named John Rawls. And John yeah. Rawls says that when it comes to what he calls fundamental rights, the state should uh, not take any position that or embrace what he calls comprehensive a comprehensive doctrine. We would, uh, we would maybe say worldview, mm -hmm. right? So initially, in in the first edition of his book, Political Liberalism, which came out in ninety three, he says he uses he uses Roe v. Wade as an illustration of his of his position. He says this is actually a perfect example of of, of liberal neutrality. Well, some of his pro life progressive friends uh, pushed back. Uh, at him, including Phil Quinn, who was a liberal pro-life professor at the University of Notre Dame philosophy department. And so in the second edition uh, of political liberalism, uh, Rawls acknowledges that when it comes to the issue of abortion, the state, no matter which way the state goes, the, the, the state, the government can go either way on abortion, that mm -hmm. as long as there are fair elections, and that you could have a pro-life state, according to Rawls, and that's perfectly liberal. Because wow. he, sa he says in there that, um, that, that, uh, that, the, that there are secular pro-life, there are pro-life arguments that fulfill the obligations of public reason. And so if, if let's say you have a democracy, oh yeah, it's really interesting. I have an art, yeah. I, have a, I have a book chapter, um, that uh, that came out about a year and a half ago. It was in a book honoring the New Testament scholar, Gary Habermas. Gary yeah. Habermas, professor at Liberty University. So Gary uh, is retiring. And so I was asked by one of his colleagues, Dave Beck, to contribute a chapter to a book honoring him. And uh, Gary doesn't write a lot. In, he actually has never written in politics. So I told Dave, I said, I, I, I'd like to write something, but I I, I want to do something on law and politics. He said, That's fine. So I wrote this article called, um, um, what is it? Political liberal. I, I forget the title of my own article, <laughs> my book chapter, but, but it's about um, political liberalism from abortion to same sex wedding cakes. Mm. And so what I do in, in the essay is talk about, oh, it's called Rawlsian liberalism and taking rights seriously from uh, abortion to same-sex wedding cakes. And what I what I talk in the chapter about is Rawls' evolution on abortion, mm -hmm. and then tie it into the debates about uh, like Masterpiece Cake Shop, you know, is it, you know, should vendors be coerced by the government to have to use their talents to celebrate, help celebrate um, same-sex weddings? And so what I argue is that under Rawlsian liberalism, they shouldn't. That, that And I use Rawls's view on abortion as an example of Rawls kind of taking a step back and saying, no, this is a, this is actually tightly tethered. Yeah, indeed, it is tightly tethered to comprehensive doctrines, but it's something it's, it's really a debate liberalism can't solve. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so what, what I do in the, in the case of the, the wedding cake vendors is that, in fact, weddings are much more tightly tethered to liturgical traditions. And so, and comp and for that reason, comprehensive doctrines. And so if Rawls is, is, is right about, uh, abortion, well, then clearly we have to, it's wrong for the state to coerce people to 
participate in what they think are liturgical celebrations that that mm. that that uh, are out that their conscience requires they not they not uh, engage in. So, yeah. So so I think you know interesting. I think in terms of a liberal state, if you take Rawls's view, yeah, I think you can have a pro life liberal state. Um, on the other hand, there are those that say that uh, the pro life view violates liberalism because it's the the government taking a view and saying it's correct but i don't see how that differs from the government not protecting unborn human life i mean isn't that at the same time implying that unborn human beings are not full-fledged members of the community who are entitled to the protections of the laws i mean that to me is not neutral either so i think rawls and the later rawls is actually kind of right i mean there's really no neutral way to yeah. resolve this debate no matter which way the state goes it's going to be making some kind of claim about human nature and who belongs and who doesn't yeah i think that's excellent and i, I i'm glad that i learned that about john rawls also just on an aside when you mentioned taking right seriously is that dworkin no that's that's i have a book called taking i have a book called taking right seriously but it's r-i-t-e-s oh okay yeah so that's that's my <laughs> oh, that's so that's my play on, on and so uh, yes, yeah, so I published a book uh, eight years ago with another book with Cambridge called Taking Right Seriously, Law, Politics and the Reasonables of Faith. Mm. It was totally a Google driven title because I thought to myself, I, actually, I, I took the title from a title of an article. Um, uh, I, I forget his name, there's a, a professor at um, uh, recently retired professor at Notre Dame. He has an article called Take, oh, Paul Whiteman. So Paul Whiteman has his article called Taking Right Seriously, R-I-T-E-S. It's a response to Dworkin and Rawls. Hmm. And so I, when my publisher wanted the title, I took Whiteman's title. I gave him full credit and you can actually take titles. It's not a, a copyright is titles are not protected by copyright. So I I, th mm -hmm. I, th I thanked Paul, and of course it wasn't a book title; it was an article title. And I it, again, I was Google driven in the sense that I thought if people type in over a number of years, people will type in Dworkin's title, and they Google will offer my title as an alternative. Nice, right? So, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so. Um, yeah, so that's I guess that's the way to go. Just try to find puns as your titles, right? So, mm -hmm. well, now I, I want to take the questions and kind of expand them beyond just the kind of, um, you know, the, the kind of legal sphere that we've been centering on, and just focus now on the public and also just what's been going on in, in recent news. And yeah. so the first question that I have is just, you know, when we think about, you know, especially progressive women and and on social media and how they've reacted to this decision. I mean, on one hand, like, I, even though I do think that abortion is morally reprehensible, um, on the other hand, I do understand, at least if I had their worldview, which I once did, um, if I had their worldview, how it would feel, at least for the women, you know, who are hearing this and feel as if their bodies are kind of being played with on the legal, uh, on the legal scene. And, you know, just all those things that might be going through their minds. And so I'm just wondering... You know, Dr. Beckwith, um, how would you go about maybe trying to reason with somebody yeah. who really has the strong pro-choice background and feels like they are in a state of panic right now? Yeah, well, the first thing I wouldn't do is engage them on Twitter. That's yeah. I wouldn't do that because I think that there are certain types of media that are just not conducive to a reasonable discussion. Mm -hmm. Now, I think you're right insofar as yes people uh are deeply troubled by this and i think pro-lifers have to recognize and i think this is true of regardless of what issue uh that you're when you're talking with people who disagree with you it's not primarily a matter of reason yeah. in this in this sense mm -hmm. it's not that reason isn't involved it's not that people are not I'm not suggesting people are unreasonable. I think in a sense, we're all kind of unreasonable. <laughs> in the, I mean, I think that we, we, we are oftentimes driven uh, by our passions and we should recognize that in other people. So I, I, this comes out, by the way, whenever, uh, and I've had this happen to me, so this is a kind of confession. 
uh, there are times in which I find myself gravitating to certain views because the wrong people hold the opposite views. Yeah. Mm. And that's a bad habit, right? And so one of the things that we have to remember, especially today, we've got hyper polarization. People are much more moved by like what team you're on. Mm -hmm. And that is so dangerous. I, I, and, and that, you know, there could be, uh, you know, I don't think this is a, a case like this for a lot of people, but I think for some people it is. So how do you engage people? Well, again, I wouldn't do it on social media. And if I did it on social media, I'd make sure it's a venue where I could actually say something in an extended fashion, not 240 whatever characters, which are permitted on, uh, on Twitter. I, I think that you have to uh, try to get people to focus on the central question which I think the central question is this, who and who is not a member of the human community? So to give you an example of how one case that I, one situation I had, this is a, several decades ago, I was a young professor at UNLV, at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and I was working out at the Las Vegas Athletic Club, and I got into an argument about abortion of all things with a local eye doctor who was around my age. So we were both fairly young and it came up because there was a, uh, a referendum question that was gonna be on the ballot in Nevada. And she overheard me talking to somebody about it and she interrupted and we got into a discussion and, and she brought up the cases. She said, well, what do you do in cases of rape or incest? So immediately what she did was she moved the discussion away from whether the unborn human being is a member of the human community to a very difficult and emotional question. Yeah. Somebody, a question involving a violent and wicked act done, uh, done to somebody in engaging, using one's powers that are gifted to us for love in the pursuit of violence. That, that it, it is evil and wicked. But what I did, I, I turned to her and I said, what if there were no cases of rape, of rape or incest, would you still be for abortion rights? I said, so let's sit. And she looked at me and she said, yes. I said, then why do you bring it up? It's not relevant to your case. Your case really is that the fetus is not one of us. Mm -hmm. And it was like, there was a quiet, because what happened, a little crowd had kind of gathered around us. And there was really, there was like dead silence. And I said, so let's talk about that. And she didn't want to. Mm. And, and I think, you know, something else, I, I think my young self didn't see it, but my older self looking back probably is more aware of the fact that she may have, of herself may have had an abortion right and so she might have been in pain and so by and it clearly hurt and by to recognize the full humanity of the unborn human being is in fact i mean it's a personal weight right and so pro-lifers i think have to recognize that that it's that you're you're dealing with in some cases certainly not all but in some cases women that have been deeply wounded Right, it may be deeply wounded by the pieties of the sexual revolution. Right, they've been sold a bill of goods. They've been told that the hookup culture or uh, the idea of a permanent commitment to another person is somehow part of the patriarchy. Right, and so what they and so they feel this pain, this absence, and again, they may have had an abortion, and. But to actually entertain the possibility that entire narrative is wrong is yeah. also painful. Mm. So it's like, so it's a combination of all these things, right? The, 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 the belief system that I thought was good may very well be the very thing that led me to procure an abortion. But if I realize that that is a, a vote, that was a vulnerable human being that is part of our community, 
then that's, I mean, so it's, it's a lot of layers of emotion and tragedy. And so that's just why I do not engage online people who fit that description precisely because I don't think it's really a matter of philosophical debate for yeah. them. Mm -hmm. It's not, it, it's something else. And it's the same, uh, you know, it's the same thing that's, that goes on um, when uh, I think from the other side of the aisle, right, where you, you'll find, um, uh, you know, uh, let's say conservatives who have, let's say, been significantly damaged by, uh, uh, let's say, woke culture, <laughs> you know, let's say they've been marginalized, they lost their job, thinking that every time somebody brings up racism, it's a view, it's always woke. <laughs> mm. Right. So, I mean, there, so you have to be, you have to be careful. Right. And it's, it's, it's difficult, right. It's difficult to do. Um, Dr. Beckwith, that was a, that was a really wonderful answer. Um, here's my last question. Yeah. So, you know, we're now talking about, um, you know, in recent news, we've heard that Nancy Pelosi, uh, Pelosi has been barred from receiving communion. And I want to get your thoughts uh, on that particular matter, if you have any. Yeah, so I've, I, I've kept up with it a little bit. Um, it's Archbishop Cordellini. Is that how I pronounce his name? Um, from what I from what I see, it's it's like Cord Cordiglione or something. Cordiglione. Like that. I should. I've met him, and I should. <laughs> I was actually. I spoke. Was it nine years ago? Was it nine years ago? It, or maybe been eight years ago at an event in Berkeley. And I stayed the night, I think, at St. Patrick's Seminary. And I think he and I, another bishop drove me to the airport. <laughs> so I think it's been a while. So I'm not sure it was, I'm not, still not sure entirely. I mean, you know, I'm at that age where I don't remember everything. But uh, so, yeah, so, yeah, so he, he wrote this letter, um, mm -hmm. uh, I guess a public letter to the diocese and archdiocese. And you know, his basically barring her because of her not in this, I think people have to understand this distinction. He's not barring her because she is personally pro-choice, right? That, that, by the way, is not a position that Catholics should hold anyways, but it's one thing to say that you disagree with the church as a matter of conscience. You just, let's say you can't, you understand the church's views, uh, you know, this is a typical way to think about, let's say, disagreeing with the church. Supposing you're a, you're a Catholic in good standing and you have a difficulty believing in a doctrine. Yeah. The right way to approach this as a Catholic is you acknowledge it and you, but you don't like go around and start advocating, <laughs> you know, that the church should get rid of this doctrine or the church is mistaken on it. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a that's and, and of course it depends on the doctrine, right? If it's something like the doctrine of limbo, which really isn't an official doctrine, that's different. That's something that's disputed amongst theologians. Or if you believe um, that, um, let's say, the church is wrong about when life begins, uh, which by the way is not the same thing as believing that abortion is wrong. This is something that uh, that Pelosi herself confuses. Uh, several years ago. She mentioned the fact that Augustine, St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas did not believe that life began at conception, and that's true, but they didn't believe that meant that prior to that time in which there was rational insolment that abortion was permissible. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a confusion between those two. So uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a bishop, uh, Cordi, uh, uh, how do you probably, uh, Was it Cord Cordiglione? Cordiglione, uh, Archbishop Cordiglione, is within his, it's within his power to do this. Uh, he can, uh, just like, you know, you know, the Pope Francis gave discretion to the bishops when it came to Latin Mass, uh, the same sort of thing concerning this. Now, uh, it's a little bit different, right? I mean, it's one thing, the Latin Mass is not intrinsically immoral, <laughs> whereas, uh, abortion is. And so given the fact that uh, 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 Speaker Pelosi is third in line to become actually second in line to become president, right? Mm -hmm. So if it, you know, it, it's vice president, then Speaker of the House, 
Uh, she, other than uh, she's behind President Biden, President Biden does not reside in, 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 in the Archdiocese of, of San Francisco. If he did, I have no doubt that Cordy Leone would mm -hmm. also bar the president, but the president resides, his primary residence, I think is in Delaware, but he is obviously living in Washington, DC and our, our, the archbishop uh, there, Gregory, uh, has not chosen to do that. Um, and uh, so his thinking is that uh, it, she is actually, she's not only saying that she can't believe the Catholic view, she is advocating mm -hmm. that the law reflect a view that says that unborn human beings are not uh, members of the human community and are not entitled to the protection of the law. And she even goes further and says, by supporting uh, several different uh, proposals by Congress to pass legislation concerning conscience, that even Catholic doctors and nurses who do conscientiously object to abortion cannot conscientiously object under this proposed legislation. So now, so there's different layers here, right? There's the, hmm. the, 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 the first off, personally, she, she doesn't agree with it. That's one thing. Secondly, she is advocating, she, she's, then the, the second is, I'm not going to try to overturn Roe v. Wade. That's second, that's so, so in both cases, you simply hold a belief and you're not doing anything. Third, no, I'm going to go further and, and try to pass federal legislation that specifically codifies Roe v. Wade. And then fourth, I'm not only going to do that, I'm going to make sure that that other Catholics who accept the church's view will be punished by the state. So so I think that you, if you look at it in context, it's not simply she is being denied communion because she happens to be pro-choice. Mm -hmm. And I doubt that the archbishop would do it for, for, for a congregant for that reason. And that he probably knows the numerous congregants who hold that view. But the fact is her, the public scandal that it causes for the Catholic faith. Yeah. And plus the nature of the legislation that she has advanced, right? That so I mean I think if you look at it in terms of, and a lot, this I have never seen any commentator bring this up, but I I've been thinking about it. The idea that she advocates legislation that doesn't even protect Catholics that disagree with her is is actually I think even in some ways more scandalous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Well. Yeah, I mean, at this point, I, even the people who are kind of complaining about, you know, Pelosi being denied communion, even, you know, uh, in the Catholic Church, I mean, at that point, I mean, if they heard that she even didn't, she would not even allow exceptions for conscientious objectors, you know, or people who don't want to engage in that, that she would even maybe coerce them or punish them. Yeah, that's something else. Yeah, right. that, that's that the people don't don't realize that that it, it's not simply that she holds the view that she does. I mean, one could like, I mean, I can easily imagine a case where let's say you live in a society where um, you've exhausted every means to protect unborn human life. And you just have to live with the fact that that's just the law and it's never going to change. And so uh, you kind of keep quiet about your view, right? Or you announce, you, you say you hold the view, but you also say, I promise never to try to change the law, even though you know, there's probably no way you could change it anyways, right? I mean, even though I, I, I wouldn't be entirely comfortable with that, I could, yeah. I could understand someone holding that view, or let's say somebody running for office in a state where like 90% of the voters are pro-choice, and there's like no way you're going to get elected unless you say you're not going to uh, deal with abortion law. And so you say that, that's, that's one thing. But then to, right, supposing you're in a state where it's a pro-life state and you run as, I want to change it to allow the right to abortion. That's completely different, mm -hmm. right? So in the first case, it's really a prudential judgment. You decide to just not do anything because you realize practically it's not going to happen. And you do want to be able to affect the law in a positive way. So you run for office. That's one. The other example is one in which you actually are advocating yeah. the view and that that's not that and that that's her position but again she even goes further than just advocating government staying out of it she wants government to be involved with it insofar as coercing conscientious objectors well dr beckwith thank you uh, for this conversation today and i appreciate just yeah all the the legal insights that you brought and also this the 
the the wisdom, pastoral wisdom, if you will, that you you showed to the last question, and even yeah. here in in this final question that we just had, um, you just laid out the facts, and so I really appreciate that. Thank you so much.